doing? How you doing? What's Up Brody was created as a safe space for the 12 million strong live entertainment and theatrical professionals. Peace and welcome everyone to What's Up Brody? How you doing? I am Noelle Jordan, executive producer and creator for What's Up Brody. In my career, I am a live event and touring lighting designer, stage manager, and background technician. What's Up Brody was created as a safe space for the million strong live entertainment and theatrical professionals. This is a place for us to come and talk it out, whether we're missing the life, analyzing it, or looking for new careers all together. This is the space where we'll talk about it. Today, we are joined by another amazing panel of artists and musical professionals, as well as our live entertainment mental health advocate. I encourage everyone to engage in the live chat on the What's Up Roadie, How You Doing? Facebook Live page. Today's episode, just like with this season, we are talking about equity in the industry or the lack thereof. <laughs> equity, as we know, is defined as a state, quality, or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair. Our moderator for today is the wonderful singer, songwriter, artist, musician, all around, Miss April Sampe. Hey, beautiful. How are you? How are you? I am good. How are you? Magically delicious. Thank you so much for asking. Listen, all I have to say is I appreciate you even allowing me to be a part of this platform and for creating this space because there are a lot of people who are going through so much during these trying times and now we have a platform where we can actually discuss what we are going through and explain to the people who don't know what the real life, what real life looks like behind the scenes when it comes to being an entertainer. So kudos to you. You are all that in two bags of chips. Thank speaking, you. Speaking of all that in two bags of chips, get a look at this panel. I mean, just amazing melanin, beauty, masculine beauty handsomeness like we just got everything um on this panel and nothing but talent and i'm appreciative of being able to you know just be a part of it so we have javon gilliam a principal symphonist for the national symphony orchestra and owner of capital percussion and backline rental in washington dc how are you doing april i'm great thank you for having me to you and nj and uh, i'm just happy to be here and to listen and learn and to commune with, with everybody. So thanks for having me. Appreciate well, it. We're happy to have you. I can say that. We have Tracy on Martin, who is an artist, a ranger, and a multi-instrumentalist. Okay. We have, she's a music director for Melanie Fiona and Janelle Monet. Get a load of this black girl magic. How are you, Tracy on? I am doing beautiful and wonderful and just happy to be here and on this panel full of amazing creatives today. So thank you. Well, we're definitely happy to have you as well. We got Jeff Bradshaw, who is a soul and jazz trombonist, a Grammy nominated artist. And right now he is riding the wave of his latest successful album, Stronger. Hey, Jeff Bradshaw. Greetings to all, greetings to all with superpowers. <laughs> we got superpowers up in here. And speaking of superpowers, we also have James Woodard, who is also known as James Poet. He's a mental health advocate, managing partner, musician, and musician for Future Band DC LLC. Hey, James. Hey, hey, hey. I'm excited to be here. Uh, looking forward to where this conversation goes. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And as Noelle said earlier, we are talking about live concerts, the artists and organizations. So might I also add, what's up, Brody? How you doing? All right, y'all. Let's get started. Y'all ready? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. All right, you guys. I have to know 
what does equity mean to you as it relates to the entertainment industry? I'll kick it off here. Um, I think it's an, I mean, aside from what's been going on in, you know, uh, in the mainstream news with, you know, all the killings and all the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, what happened with the Capitol with, you know, the insurrection with uh, non-Black people, um, working in an industry where I am one out of a hundred, literally, I'm the only Black musician in the orchestra. Uh, wow. For me, equity ends up taking on um, a slightly different um, uh, meaning. Uh, I know that I'm on this platform, both literally and figuratively. So for me, equity is about creating a space where I can um, I can show other people that look like me that this is also an opportunity to make a living, right? It's a place where I can feel like I actually, you know, I don't actually feel like I have to stick out any more than I already do. And so for me, equity is actually not necessarily about, you know, making sure that there's parity, it's more about inclusion. Mm -hmm. And when I look at it that way, for me, it's what makes me sort of proud to be the only uh, African-American, uh, especially African-American principal uh, in a tempest in a major symphony orchestra in the country. Um, but at the same time, I realize there's a lot of work to do. And for me, I've tried to try to find the best way to do that. And the best way for me to do that, that I found is to be a good person and to try to be inclusive by showing other little black boys and girls that you can actually be in an orchestra and make a living. So it works for me. Wow. Who else wants to answer? Cause I, that, thank you for that. I, I'll go, um, for me, uh, I'll delve into the woman side of it later, but I guess just so much being able to fit in and thrive in whatever facet of of your particular interest and in what you do well in without conditions and without underlying reasons for doing it and not just being the token black person and you you get you know you get perks just because you serve as the entity that's this many people or like eight percent of it um and just being good and like you get all the credit that you need to get because you are dope and uh, that's that's really what it means for me, um, which we still working on, but we getting there. Though. <laughs> getting there. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I see the green lights around me. Uh, I feel the same. You know, I'm gonna piggyback off of Javon. I think that um, for me as well, uh, just being a trombone player, but also what Trace just said that, like, being dope and being in a a genre of music or being in mainstream soul music or uh, uh, where I live, mainstream soul music or soul jazz or whatever kind of box they want to square, they want to put you in. Um, being being recognized, uh, not just being recognized, but being recognized for being uh, great at what you do, but all, and, or should I say, being not just being great for being, playing a trombone and taking it mainstream and uh, different from so many other instruments, but also being credited for being great at what you do, just because you're great at what you do. Not because I'm black, not because I play the trombone, not because it's like, oh, it's the only guy who does that at this place. And that. But also uh, being able to uh, put out put myself in a position where, uh, like I said, like to uh, celebrate with the generation that's coming behind us so they can see that there's somebody that looks like them that can be accredited for how good they are. Not just because they're black, just because you're dope, you know? Right. Um, I think it's important to always strive to be the best that you can be in whatever industry that you're in, but it shouldn't be a situation where because I am a black man that I have to go that much further just because of my race. And so I think equity for me is making sure that the industry start begins to create uh, a safe space for us uh, to get our just due and, and not be frowned upon or be or have an afterthought about us because of the complexion of our skin. Um, yeah. So just creating that that space where it's like we just get our just due. Like, like everyone has said, you know, we get credit for uh, what we've created. Um, we get um, equity in what we earned. Because um, a lot of the, we are famous for 
making millionaires that don't look like us, billionaires that don't look like us. And so equity, when it comes to a financial standpoint, is we, we get paid for what we do for real. So that's, that's my answer. You know, um, one thing that pretty much all of you are saying, and this is what I'm hearing, pretty much if you're dope, get credit for it. Okay, so we all agree. Um, and one thing that I also love that you pretty much all said in your own words is pretty much help the person behind you. And that's one thing that I don't see very much, especially in the industry, is that there are not that many people who are reaching back for the youngins coming up. You know what I mean? And um, so I'm glad that all of you, for the most part, said reach back and get credit when you're dope. Just saying. Right. You have to remember somebody helped us, right? Somebody helped you, right? Somebody put you on the same path that you're on, whether they were, you know, they didn't necessarily have to be black, but like, I mean, sometimes they are. And a lot of times that is influential. And like, you just have to, like, I'm sure Noel told me say this a thousand times and the, you know, just paying it forward is, is it's just, it's like, it's, it's our duty as human beings, right? Mm -hmm. The state of what's going on, especially in this country right now, like it is a, it is a total shit show. Like people hate each other for the complete wrong reasons. And like these, these they're fueling the fire. And what we have to do is we have to flip that. We have to flip the script. And the only way to do that uh, effectively, in my opinion, is love. And like you said, paying things forward and making sure that you're bringing people with you so that we can, you know, sort of eradicate this as effectively and comprehensively as possible. Thanks. Tracy, I want to talk to you a little bit about the live performances. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like typically being the only woman in the band? Well, um, I, I'm going to answer this in two ways, okay? Now it's like nothing. It's just like everybody else goes to work. I show up too. Um, and perhaps because I've been in in the business long enough, I don't even really see gender at this point. Like I, I don't, it's not a thing. However, starting out, um, I give you an example, music director for Melanie Fiona. I'm, I was like 28. And then all the guys in the band were at least 32. There were some Berkeley cats in there. I didn't have <laughs> the credibility for that type of, you know, skill set. I went to school for engineering, but that was about it for me. So I was not just coming up under people who were professionally trained, but people who were kind of looking down like, little girl, you don't know what you're talking about. And that was so intimidating for me. Now, I just kind of got thrown in there. But when I back up to high school, um, I realized that I was kind of already being prepared. Like I did the trombone, shout out to Jeff, you know, <laughs> but I ended up doing drum major. And it was the same situation. You don't see a lot of females that are drum majors, but it positioned me to be in somewhat of a leadership position. Well, it is leadership and train me to be confident and comfortable. Everybody's not going to agree with me. And if I say something a certain way, it may come off like I'm being a B because I'm demanding authority, but that's my job. So fast forward back to Melanie Fiona. Um, I just had to really suck it up pull up to the scene and, and do my job. So um, going into music director for Janelle Monet and being on emails with whoever, then showing up to the venue or whatever we're doing festival and they're looking for maybe a, a black man cause Tracy could be anybody. I'm like, hi, I'm Tracy. I'm Janelle's music director. We've been speaking for the past and they're like kind of, oh, um, so that always is funny to see because they're like, okay, yeah, get into it. Let's work. Sorry, sound check. Can we get right into the day? So I think for me, um, being able to help keep everybody else focused because I'm already there with it. Y'all come on, let's go. We ain't got time to even think about it. We, I can do this job. If you're second guessing what I'm having to do, that's your problem. Um, so again, for me now, it's not even a thing like you know, I, I, I definitely want to continue to be the face and the voice for the little girl who doesn't see a lot of women in leadership um, in the music industry. I'm not talking about a general manager at Target or whatever. I mean, that's maybe a little different, but no shade, but it's just different. And, and I understand why there's some underlying things that um, I would love to talk about. I don't know if we have time today, but why women 
typically are not found to be leaders in this industry. Um, we, you know, other than emotions, and we just want to take care of everything. Um, I, I wrote down something today, and it says just about who I am. And I ended up listening about maybe 30 different things. It wasn't just I'm an artist, I'm a musician. Um, but it says, I help people position themselves for optimal success by providing relevant assistance. That could be anybody. So if it's my friend who's a floral designer, if it's to help get her supplies, that is relevant assistance. So that's what we're doing for the artists we work for. We are providing mm -hmm assistance for them to be successful. And um, I'm just doing the same thing for myself by introducing myself. All right, let's get into it. All right. <laughs> well, that's been my experience as a woman. Um, to kind of sum it up. No, no, no. I, I can say as a woman, if I, so I have a, a, a man for a music director. And if I were mm -hmm. to turn around and see a woman in his role, do you know how good that makes me feel? No, no shade to any to any men out there. It's just that that's a position that it's so rare to see a female in or a woman in that role. So, shout out to you. Um, what about the gentlemen out there? I want to know: Do you have any specifics when it comes to the gender that you back up or perform with? <laughs> um, and be no, honest, I don't, I don't, <laughs> brutal. <laughs> I don't, that, yeah, I don't think so. I, I think that, um, I mean, I've taught with both. You know, I was the musical director for Flow With You for five years as a trombone player, you know, and solo trombone player. But then I've toured with with guys. I, I taught, I, yeah, I guess I toured mostly, mostly men from, you know, Jill to The Roots and then, you know, Jay-Z. I did Mary and... Um, uh, Kurt Franklin and they, yeah, it's mostly it was mostly men, but I tell you, man, it's something about uh, being on stage with an. I mean, I I was blessed to be on stage with people like like Jill and Mary J. Blige to tour with them. Um, obviously, Jill's like one of my best friends for like thirty two years, but um, the 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 female musical director piece is like so special to me because I'm so fan I'm so I'm such a big fan of to see the women in excellence move that way. I mean just from uh from Trey from Tracy and and, and seeing uh Cherie in DC and and seeing my girl uh down in uh Atlanta who uh music directs uh music. You know what I'm talking about uh the girl in uh, the girl in Atlanta that's the music director for music soul child. And um, uh, and Lynette out in out on the out on the West Coast, Lynette Hammond guy, Lynette. Lynette was my Lynette. The funny thing is, Lynette is my music director when I play uh, the West Coast. Lynette is an amazing, amazing musician. And you know, it's funny that I have had mostly male music directors uh, on tours that I've been on, but the women that were. Uh, musical directors, they were incredibly thorough, and it kind of wasn't like they. It, it kind of wasn't like they were. It was a woman. It was like because you know the, the band girls, you know the girls that come up in the bands, they're band girls. So it's not like it's like oh oh she's the MD and and you know I, I don't know if you know I would like to know from um uh, from Javon have have you experience any um female directors in orchestral music are there many yeah so the question was like is there a difference and my answer was going to be just straight up no okay. i think one of the beauties one of the i mean there are there is no difference no there is no difference yes there are female music directors um there are a few black ones uh they have smaller jobs okay. nothing that's um that's uh uh major uh but they're also pretty young um they're definitely a lot more black males that have music directors a couple of them are have been very very prominent over the years but i think that's one of the beauties about music like if you look at sports you have to segregate the competition because of the you know the the physical discrepancies between men and women right there is no discrepancy in music right you either are like you say you're either dope or you're not it has no idea has nothing to do with your gender and so for me 
being on stage with a man, a woman, gay, like it doesn't matter to me. Just playing tune and playing time, brother or sister or whatever. And if you're good, that's all I care about. And if we make a mistake or if something's not right, how we collaborate is way more important to me than like what you look like. You well, know? Let me ask so you, let me ask you, Javon. Awesome. Um, you work with Noel, for example, as a backline tech. Yep. Now that's a little different versus, you know, being an actual, being a musician on stage, but making mm-hmm. sure the backline is, is handled properly. And it's mm-hmm. very rare to see a woman in that, in that role. So, I mean, she's on here, so let's all pretend as if she's not, and Noel, cover your ears. But um, I want to know what you have to say about a person like Noel being the background, uh, background tech. Well, like, okay, so I just brought up the whole sports analogy. Like, there's a physical component with sports that, you know, makes the, makes the sort of playing field not necessarily level you know, but with backline, like some of the gear is 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 heavy, and this is what I love about NJ. I love about NJ. It doesn't matter what it is; she never complains. There's always a solution, and so again, it has nothing to do with the fact that she's a female. Why she's an amazing backline tech? It has the fact to do with the person that she is. Right? She chooses to say, "Here's a problem," or "Here's my job. I'm going to do my job or fix the problem." And so, when you look at it from that perspective, um, it. It, it, for me, like it sort of, it, like I said, it sort of changes the dynamic. I'm not going to go into the full story about how Noel and I met, but like we had a, we had lunch at a, at a at a restaurant in Shaw after a mutual friend sort of connected us, and I just got a vibe that she just wanted to learn and be in this field, and we didn't know each other, so I just said, hey, and I pretty much gave her the keys to the Cadillac and just said, hey, you know, I mean, she she can get in the warehouse without me. Like she can grab all the, like she could rob me dry if she wanted to. Right. And it's, there's that trust that, you know, like you have that it's, it's all about the, the, the type of person. And I know it's weird and sort of cliche to say, we don't see color these days or we don't see gender because it's important to see it, to acknowledge the inequities. Right. But in this instance, when you're looking for people, at least for me, and I'm looking for employees, I'm looking for people to work with or colleagues, like I'm just looking for the right person. And, you know, if they're willing to put the work in, we'll find a way to figure it out. So if, even if you can't lift that B3 by yourself, I'm not going to put you in that position to lift the B3 by Thank yourself. You. So that way we all look good. Right. I can't lift it by myself either. So, you I mean, but that's that's kind of sort of the way I see it. So with regards to NJ, like that's what I love about NJ is that she will she rarely says no. And if she does, she'll come back with a no. But here's how here's what I think we can do. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, that's just the quality of a good person, a good you know, coworker, a good friend. That's the, and those are the type of people you want to surround yourself with in life. And I'll bring it back to just what you all said initially. Be dope. Just be dope at what you're doing. Yeah. As long as you're dope, you'll always get you'll always get work. Um, James, I know that you've performed with a lot of people, and you know, just in general, because I, I, I want to hear what people have to say about the woman being up front. So, uh, a female singer. Sometimes I've, I've heard so many negative things and I'm only saying you just because I haven't heard from you. Um, but, you know, they always say, oh, well, the, the female artists, women artists, they're all bees. They're all bees. They, they're very uh, diva like. They're very this, that and the third. Have you ever had an experience where that's happened? So I think I think my my experience may be unique to everyone else's um, where. Um, even though they say that um, the music industry is a male dominant industry, every opportunity that I've ever had, a woman was at the forefront of it. Every single one, unless it was an opportunity that I cultivated myself somehow in, in all aspects, whether it was the PR team that worked on an opportunity, where it was somebody who uh, was connected to a, a general manager of uh, who was uh, putting an event together, it was always women at the forefront. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like what Tra- uh, Tracy on said, where she said that uh, there's just so many levels or different things that she just has her hands on that she, you can't really box her in. Right. And so because of that, I feel like I learned so much more from the women that were in position because they would just were so deep in the details of what it took to put certain events and certain opportunities together that I just learned so much. Even now, one of my uh, closest friends, she was um, on tour with, uh, what's the young lady? Shea Butter Baby. What's, who, who sang that song? Love it, boy. Ari Lennox. 
Ari Lennox. So she was on tour for two years. Uh, that's one of my best friends. And so that, and who is also my guitar teacher. She's my teacher. And just, just being able to sit and just learn with all the different women that have been at the forefront of all these opportunities has just been a blessing. So I haven't had a, a situation where uh, I can compare, you know, men to women. It's really all been women. Hmm. Okay. I, have, I have a question. Um, if I could just jump in real quick, April, just off of what the guys were saying about how they, their vantage point when they see us, um, be it the music director, be it the artist or the backline tech. And really you guys are just saying like how we're so skilled that we can, you know, hold it down. We can make sure that all the different moving parts um, work well. So my question for the women, do you feel more pressure? I'll let you go, Tracy, on first. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> don't, that, don't get me wrong. Like uh, we put in the work that's necessary to get the desired results, but it is pressure, y'all. Like I, I'm not one to crown the job. Okay, it's just it's not a place for it. But I can tell you on more than two hands, I can remember not even barely making it to my car, just having a breakdown because we still have emotions like that we be working through. And sometimes they be trying to lift up. You know, how you get that lump in your throat right here when you want to cry. <laughs> so, you know, so you got to hold the lump because there are a lot of things to manage in your head. It's like the conversation between like here and here and in your heart. And you like, you know what? It It's, you, you may quit before you leave at least in your mind, um, but that pressure, the, the pressure doesn't change. I will say that. Um, mm. Granted, I don't see gender, but I'm pretty sure the pressure that a man feels in the leadership position as opposed to a woman, it, 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 I don't think it's comparable. And um, for me, I will say to that, my best advice is to find something. When we first got on, we talked about things we like to do. The way that I decompress, I love hiking. I love going to the gun range. I love driving my Jeep. I love doing things that are just out because I'm able to just kind of express and like get that stuff out. Because if not, you're going to go crazy. The artists will call you at 2 a.m. They're calling from L.A., but that's not late for them. So that means you're in the most beautiful sleep of life that you could be in. You have to wake up and do the work. Don't even worry about that 11 o'clock rehearsal that you haven't started learning the music for that you was like, I'm going to get up at six o'clock. But, you know, it, you, you have those things going on in, in your mind and that pressure to complete the job with excellence is on you as women. I, I think some women and I'm just going to try to keep it general, but I think sometimes women think we can get a pass because we got the body, we got the charm, we got whatever men desire to desire and you can try that you can be the tour hole but it at the end of the day it's really gonna like <laughs> show up in your in your work and in your experience and thank god like that that doesn't follow my back so <laughs> I don't have to do that. but that's right. what'd you say but that, that's, that's a right tour <laughs> Jeff, you know, you know, it's a tour on every tour. Wait a minute. Um, so Why I gotta know though? <laughs> <laughs> Why I gotta know though? Everybody knows. This is not just you. Everybody knows, Chandler. Everybody knows the tour though. What? But, <laughs> but it's people, even like with that, if somebody happens to see somebody from another camp talking to you, they may come up with an assumption that, oh, see, I knew she was up to something. And it's like, then you got to consider that what every everything, I think that's where the pressure comes in, not just about what you do, but about the the image you're portraying. So I'm always like on lunch breaks, my lunch breaks used to be lit. Like I can go hang out with everybody, but now it's like... No, most of the time I'm still working on an edit on lunch break. By the time I finish, I got five minutes to go run to the cafe at center staging that might just the close. Now I don't get to eat. So now I'm hungry and under pressure. So, you know, it's just, it's a lot of things 
to um, consider and to hold down. So I also do think it is okay to cry when you get home. Like that, that's on you. And yeah. you find you find a way to manage those emotions because it's necessary and I think it's healthy or whatever way you you process what you need to process to get it out so you can show up and be the best the next day. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's where I'm at with it. Even now, still, I still have my day. I'm like, oh god, okay, all right, back tomorrow. <laughs> No, I love it. I love it. Um, you know what? I'll just I'll keep I'll keep going because I'm I, I'm not behind the scenes. I'm yeah. So, <laughs> hey, bro, may I, may I ask a question? Please. How how do you all uh, manage in situations where things don't quite go so well? So, like you said, uh, Tracy, that um, you know you, you might have to do an edit during your lunch. What what happens if it's not a hundred percent? or 75%. How do you internalize that? How do you work through that? Oh, well, um, well, I've been in situations where the artist has been upset with me, like during the show, like something happened, Logic tripped and started replaying one section. I'm new to Logic, I'm new as a music director. And I don't know if you've ever been on stage when something that traumatic happens. And in your mind, you just, you just really want to, jump off a cliff and like just throw the keyboard over throw the whole thing out but um af <laughs> afterward well first thing you got to be honest and you can't blame it on anything but you you, you did it happened and you got to be like I'm you know even if you apologize the artist doesn't want to hear that or if we're in the middle of, of of the lunch break like you were saying like I was saying if I'm not done with the edit by the time it's time to get back to work. That's their money. They're paying for that rehearsal space that costs so many dollars in every hour they're having to pay for it. So back to the pressure, what you do, if you need to call a friend, get some help because sometimes you just may not be able to figure it out or you can just not over promise and under deliver. Just tell the artist, listen, I know like that. what you want to do and we're going to make it happen. However, the best thing as my job as music director is not just to do everything the artist wants. That that's not real life. I'm not a yes person. I am a I am a person that makes it feel like they can at least have something to say, and I honor that. Where it's like, hey, I want to change the bridge. I was like, well, maybe let's try it here or put it on the end. And it can be like we done had a whole show arranged, and you want to change it up the last two hours on my way to rehearsal. You want to change the show? That happened to me. And we're on the bus riding. And I said, all right, guys. So, you know, Janelle wants to change the whole show. And it's my job to maintain that energy in that entire room. It's not just music only. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be done, so I don't hold it all the time. But I realized music director means a lot of things. I become a wardrobe uh, personnel. I become a janitor. I become a friend. I become a counselor. I become... A, hook, a, 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 a cook sometimes if you, I mean just you become back to that woman the details you have to pay attention to everything and the artist comes in and the first thing she does she looks at me and asks well what are we going to do today and so I'm having to be the brain in the head for not just the artist but the text I have to maintain a great relationship with the crew because I'm gonna need crew to stay a little later too now that we got to make this edit and it's like, uh, and I got to make bands stay longer. Um, so in the moment, in that very uncomfortable moment, um, you just have to be honest with yourself first and be honest with the artist. Like if you can't do it, you just can't do it. And you will do whatever, call a friend, reach out. And if it's just completely impossible, just tell them we can't do it. And that's going to be that. Respect. Can't do it. You know what, James, it's funny that you um, asked that question because that was going into the next question. So <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I wanted to know what are the biggest obstacles that all of you all have been faced with? And so I get it from Tracy. It seems like one of your biggest obstacles is changing right at the last minute. And trust me, I have been there. Um, I hate that. So <laughs> for the rest of you, um, what have been you all's biggest obstacles? Um, I'll take that first. Oh, okay. Um, 
and I'm speaking from the backline side of it. I can um, pick you back up whatever you say, so you go ahead. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I've been caught, and it's not only with backline, with concert percussion, also a lot of it is very no, fair enough. Um, Like, I have had to change, uh, what was it, the bass drum head? The um, running curve is steep. Yeah, it was like a 32 or something like mm. that. And so I had at the at the Kennedy Center with the National right. Symphony Orchestra mm. on stage. And they're like, you gotta you gotta change this out. They're going to get a, a drum head from Javon's office, brought that up. I'm taking it, you know, all the lugness, everything off, changing the head, and then I gotta tune it. And it's like you do feel that pressure because it's like they're waiting on me. So, I mean, those situations, I mean, we've had where somebody forgot the keys at Trelectro. <laughs> I did. I did. They were in my pocket. I know. Oh, it made me oh you were the somebody. The, I had to yes. drop no, I, uh, I know. I know. I think what Noel's saying is absolutely true. Um, and for backline owning, you know, every amp, every keyboard, every drum set, everything that any artist wants over all the brands, one thing, it's daunting. But the one thing about backline that I've learned is the drums are the most intricate part. Yes, if an amp breaks, you just get another core, you just bring another amp, right? You can't really fix that on site. You have to outsource that. But there's so many tiny parts to the drums, you know, hi-hat clutches and cymbal felts and, you know, pedal, you know, pedal, 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 everything is all very, very meticulous. And if one thing is off, the entire instrument doesn't work. And so like being able to sort of have people that are willing, Noel, uh, being willing to learn that is really key, you know, like, and I think I remember that bass drum incident. I wasn't there for some reason no. somehow, because they went downstairs to get one from my stash. But I think I called you to walk you through it, but I don't think I had a good reception. There was something that happened and you just figured it out. And like, you know, um, those are the challenges where, you know, that's how you learn, you know, I've spent the last six months learning the stock market on the go. And how do you learn it? You do it. You make a mistake. You realize you're getting say, to something. Oh, sorry. You just flip it. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I would say Javon's a really great, uh, teacher. I mean, he is that also. Um, but I mean, just for me, because I didn't, I don't play. Right. Um, I was raised by musicians, but I, I, I stopped playing piano, you know, after a while. I may dabble, but I don't play. So for me, my challenge was I need to know all of these instruments. I need to know everything from a bongo to a five octave marimba. Mm. And I'm very proud of that um, because it does take, it takes a lot of work takes a lot of fails and but you know we always say fail forward yep. um but that's been like those being backline yeah that's those obstacles are pretty stressful and you know just like any other part of the industry whether it's the music director whether it's the musicians whether it's the sound company whether it's the backline company whether it's the artists themselves whether it's the transportation if one link fails the whole thing goes into the toilet right mm -hmm. you gotta it all has to work and so you know and that's one of the things that i think noel and i learned on the fly with capital percussion is that like you have to make sure that the gear goes out in perfect condition um and you know having you know uh, the hustle that we used to do when we first got started like it was a stretch um but you know you 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 grow you you, you get lucky you get a few clients that give you a chance and when you succeed they call you back and it just so happens that you know like i have grinded to try to find you know some quality loyal clients and they've returned the favor and so just having good people noel will always be my first call for tech because she presents herself she makes the company look good they might never see me they might not ever see javon you know unless you're at the Kennedy center because i live there with my other job but like most of the other venues they'll never see me right they might know who i am they might know i'm the tippinist in the nso they might know that I've got this other thing, but Noelle shows up. She's always on time. She's always with a smile. Her hair is always laid. Like it's always a good thing. And she makes me look good. And 
it's those type of people you want to surround yourself with. You surround yourself with people that know more than you, that are better than you, that can provide value to you and to your company and to your life. And it's a reciprocal uplift. And that's what makes it so great, right? She adds value to my life because she makes my company grow. And I like to think I add value to her life because I'm trying to, you know, like we, we, we work together. And it's that sort of camaraderie. It's that sort of familial um, bond that I've tried to create with my company. And uh, I'd like to think, knock, knock, that I've done a pretty good job of doing that. So. Definitely. Wow. Nice, nice, nice. That's dope. Uh, Jeff, I want to actually ask you a question. Oh. Are you sitting down? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know what challenges were you faced with when you stepped away from being I mean, from when you stepped away from a mainstream artist to become a mainstream artist. <laughs> Funny story. Okay. Brief, because I know we ain't got that much time. But after playing trombone and touring for many years with so many different artists, such a blessing to be, to have, be in that position and to have done it. But uh, so... My first album came out in 2003, Bone Deep. Um, so I had to um, uh, to wait like nine years because I was on Hidden Beach Recordings, which was me, Kendra the Family Soul, Jill Scott, Mike Phillips. And so I had to wait in line. I had no idea I was going to have to wait nine years to release another album. But in the interim, that's crazy, right? But in the interim, I was touring with like the biggest artists in the world for those nine years, right? Come right on through that. But that was probably should have been the time where I should have been like, you know, really investing in me. And then I was playing a lot of shows, but I had no new album uh, because of the restraints of uh, waiting, being on a label, which now my, my newest album is on my own label, Bone Deep Enterprises with distribution with E1. So this is my first album on my own label and my best album. So to God be the glory for that. But um, stepping away was interesting. It was interesting. Even though I still tour on and off with Patti LaBelle since like 2012. But <clears throat> I, uh, I believe it was 2008. And we, were in, I was, uh, we was on tour with Jill earlier in the year. And I can't remember, um, I can't remember if it was the, I think it might have been the Big and Beautiful tour or the Real Thing tour. But I can't remember which tour it was in 2008. But <clears throat> I got a call to be to go out with Jay Z to do the American Gangster European the, the European leg of the Jay Z American Gangster tour, so I was like, okay. Um, um, at the time, I was married, and my uh, my wife at the time was pregnant with my my first son. So I was like, wow, okay. So we're doing the Jill Scott tour, and um, uh, I got the call to do Jay Z, but. I believe there was like a small break in the tour and it was supposed to go back out uh, with Chill. And I had to make a decision, um, had to make a decision to go and tour with Jay-Z because it was two thirds more money, obviously. So I called Jill and I said, hey, <clears throat> um, I got the car to do with Jay-Z. I, I got this car to go with Jay-Z for several months. So this European thing, I got this baby coming. Let me go make this, let me go get this money, you know? And I uh, obviously, like I said, one of my, one of my best friends about 30 years, 30, 30 plus years. And she was like, boy, go get that money. She was like, boy, go get that money. Not many artists will say that, but she was like, boy, go get that money. So I went on tour with Jay-Z. It was great. We had a great summer. It was awesome. Played some great shows, Glastonbury Festival, played places in front of millions of people, all that kind of thing. And then, Two weeks by the two weeks at the end of that before the, that end tour ended, I got the call to go out with Mary J. Blige that fall and winter <clears throat> for the Love Soul tour. So that was like two weeks at the end of that tour. So I did that tour, flew home, packed, had three days to pack and fly out to Burbank to a center stage and to start rehearsing with Mary, um, which was dope. Oh, it was awesome. So did that, right? Did that tour, got home. And had my first son, Madison. He's 12 years old now. And, and that was whole thing. It was great. Blah, blah, blah. Jill's getting, uh, pumping, getting back together to um, 
I start the next tour. <clears throat> now everybody's getting together. I'm hearing about like the rehearsals are starting this and that, but I haven't gotten an email. <laughs> you know where this is going. Uh, you know where this is going. And uh, <clears throat> uh, basically, she was like, why are you like waiting around to go on tour with somebody or with myself? You're super dope. The world needs to hear Jeff Bradshaw, Jeff Bradshaw music. Go get yours. Go be Jeff Bradshaw. You're too great to be a side man. Go be Jeff Bradshaw. Go, go let the world, go let the world do what you do. Go do what you do. Now at the time, the first thing you're thinking of is like, hey, what? I need this money. I used to go tell me to go be a I was like, what are you talking about? I just had a son. Like he's like a year old. I need to get back on the road. You know, as, as a as a full-time side man musician, you know, you're thinking like, oh my God. Like, hey. You know, so uh that's what I did. Um and I got a call to do a couple more things. Did Dave Spell Block Party Tour and did Tyler Perry for two years. And so, but my mind was strictly on working on doing me, building my brand. And, and it was a scary moment. It was scary to know that, to know that I have that blanket of, oh, I got another tour coming up. So I'll be on the road for like 10 months. So I'm good. So I can do these little things in between. Tracy, Tracy, you know what I'm talking about. And, and it was a very scary moment. Not only that, but because I'm a trombone player in the, in the, in the world, in, in the middle, in the middle, I'm like a hybrid in the middle of like this whole smooth jazz, straight ahead jazz, soul jazz, neo soul jazz, is the instrumental pop, is the instrumental R&B. You know, they don't know where to put you or, or where to play your music and all of that old kind of stuff. All of those things, those roadblocks that you run into, not just being an instrumentalist, as an instrumentalist, you run into all those things. You got to find where your music fits and all of those crazy things. But that's what happened. She kind of hired me <laughs> and was like, but you're irreplaceable and I'll never have a trombone player again on tour with me. And she hasn't since 2008. Have you ever seen Jill Scott? It's only been trumpet and saxophone. She never filled my space. She never filled my space. She said, I'll, she said that you're, you're irreplaceable. I'll never have another trombone, another trombone player. And she hasn't, <laughs> which was cool to see that. But it also, I look back at that and see that, but also look forward to know that, you know, th that was the way that I had to get, you know, I had to get my, um, I had to make that step. And if she didn't make that step, then I still would be like looking to see who's going out on tour next and, you know, who's going out on the road next and doing this and doing that so I can get that next big pay pay, pay year, go out for like nine to, nine to 10 or 11 months. So, you know, you can you know, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it was, it's a very, it was a very scary feeling. But once I settled in, with, you know, on my next record and then the re next record after that, to my live album. And I was like, this is where I belong. And this is what I'm going to do. And it's scary, but I love being a trombone player. I love being in my own lane and mainstream soul jazz and instrumental R&B music that I love being in my own lane, that they don't have anybody to compare me to. Like, I'm in, I, like they have nobody to compare me to, so I have my own lane. I'm, I'm cutting a lane for all of these young trombone players that are in school and in these marching bands or guys that are learning classical music, guys that are learning jazz and theory and going to all of these schools and they're coming out trying to find out, are they going to teach? Are they going to, uh, 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 are they going to teach? Are they going to give lessons and play in wedding bands or jazz ensembles or whatever they're going to do that they can look just like other sax players, look at other sax players and say, I'm going to make a record because I see that, you know, the sax lane is the way to go. I'm just trying to tear a lane out for us mainstream, for the mainstream music of my genre. Trombone Shorty is a really good friend of mine. He was on my last two albums. <clears throat> he had the whole thing, the whole New Orleans behind him and all of the opportunities he had. He hit right after Katrina. Trombone Shorty hit the road and he hit right after Katrina and never looked back. But that's a whole other genre of music. I'm just trying to cut a lane and continue to trailblaze for all of my young bone players out there all over the world that send me messages and <clears throat> and 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 that see that 
there's are there are other options that you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. I'm not saying that everybody's made to be an artist. Well, that's because that ain't that ain't for everybody either. <laughs> that that being, yeah, I have to I have to agree with you on that. Now, I also want to add, I always teach people or or people that I've um people that I've tried to pull up. They say, well, I don't know what lane to go into. And I say, stop trying to create a lane and create a highway or, or stop trying to be in somebody's lane and create your own highway. And it seems like you say you're creating a lane. No, 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 no. You've created a highway of your own. You know, it's just how far do you want that highway to go? And so I appreciate people like you, um, which takes me, uh, you know, a little bit further into every for everybody. I want to know about like, what you had to deal with when it came to family, friends, and pushback. When a lot of you started in, in, in entertainment, um, you probably got a lot of pushback. And I want to know, you know, how, what, what type of pushback did you get or did you get any? And if you didn't, what kind of support did you get from your family? I don't know if James wanted to talk about what his challenges were, um, but I, I wanted to just piggyback off of what Jeff said. First of all, I appreciate Jeff because me growing up like in high school and getting ready to leave, I had a scholarship uh, to Alabama A&M, but I was like, I don't want to play trombone in college. I'm so over it. But I also didn't see anything past where could I go other than a wedding band or a wedding band, or just teaching private lessons. I'm like, that ain't no, you know, so it's like, so for him to provide like the blueprint of a successful trombone artist, you know, and and, and do well, not just like gimmicky, because he's the only person back today. He's just dope. I don't know if y'all heard the record, but like, he's just really dope. And he has his own sound, because then there's that part where every trombone player doesn't sound the same. So then finding that voice on your horn and like, man, oh, he's actually like, people actually appreciate a trombone. What is this thing? And people like, well, I don't, <laughs> how do you play? And it's like, this is beautiful because it just shows um, how far you can go when you just get in there and you, and you don't allow only what you've seen or been exposed to. Um, because again, after I got out of high school, which is probably a lot of people's story, I put my horn down and my it was just in the case for years, for years and years. And I was about to pawn it as a matter of fact, not even cause I needed the money. It was just taking up space. Like, oh, I don't need this in here. Um, but again, I just wanted to just show you love, Jeff, because it, it's just, it's so important. And I can tell students who want to go into other facets. I'm like, listen, I know this really dope guy and, and, and he's really doing it so I can show them. And um, I just wanted to say that. Uh, Thank as you. far as like, yeah, as, as far as transitioning, I come from a PK family, pastor's kids. So my parents, honestly, they didn't give me pushback about going on the road. They were happy because I was paying a nice tithe and uh, offering check every every week. <laughs> and they was like, when are you going back on the road, girl? When are you, when are you going? <laughs> I was like, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but it, I think if any pushback, it was more um, my friends who kind of was like, well, you don't reach out anymore. I'm like, you don't reach out anymore takes two so um bye you can miss me with that like uh, i'm paying my tithes and i'm happy about that so uh, that, that was the only kind of weird, weird thing for me um i do want to say one thing though i had the situation and, and it's um when i got the position as music director i experienced more uh discord within the band than i did outside because the person who put me on the gig, had been on the gig for five or six years. Only eight months into my tenure with this group is when I got the position for music director. So imagine like just that whole scenario and now having to give orders to somebody who brought you on, that was just, that, that, that thing worked on me. That thing worked on my inside so good. It, it was just like a bacteria that just, and, and I just had to kind of push past it because I'm like, 
well, I, I didn't set this up. I didn't ask for the position, which I later found out they wanted the position as music director. And I, I'm like, listen, I, I, somebody saw that I was qualified or at least the most qualified for the time that was, you know, necessary to get in there. And, um, I think that's been the, the biggest thing for me, maintaining my focus in the middle of a, in a pandemic, not like the pandemic we're in right now, but like literally or like mentally of somebody trying to be like, you betrayed me. Yes, you brought me in, but it wasn't up to me or whoever decided what they decided saw something in me. I appreciate you putting me on, but I'm not entitled. So, um, that's, well, that's it's it because you are dope. We, we, that's we, because you're dope. It's because you're dope. So, <laughs> I, and, and this is no shade to that person, but obviously there was something that you brought to the table that they were not bringing to the table. So never, ever, ever, you know, when a per when that happens, you can't look at the person and say, my bad. No, it's your bad. It's your bad because you did not do what you were supposed to do. Amen and amen again. Hey, can I <laughs> jump in right there? Hey, but can I say something really quick? Really quick. No. Like, <laughs> Did you say no? <laughs> I did. I'm joking. I was joking. <laughs> but, but I just want to say this really quick to, to Tracy. Like, people don't understand that musical directing, tour musical directing, uh, it's you got the position. They gave it to you because it's more than just being a person that can really put a dope show together. But musical directing bands on tour, it's about not just commanding the respect of your contemporaries but it's really about personality management people don't understand it but like you know like i think i think it's a west coast thing <clears throat> where it's like everybody hears all the music everybody's here gonna be professional play, play the music that's on the sheet come on let's go we're gonna start from line number one that, that it's an east coast thing even even in texas and midwest it's an east coast thing where it's like Here's the arrangement. Here's some of the music that goes along with the arrangement. But it's also a personality management job. People don't understand it. Musical directors are normally really cool people that know how to manage personalities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, also with being dope, I think that's why you got that opportunity. Because not only were you dope, but you are a person that they felt like could manage the personalities because when you're putting, you know, and possibly six to ten, six to ten people, depending on how big the band and background singers, on a tour bus together, all of these personalities for ten months or maybe a year, like you're still, even though there's a tour manager, even though there's a road manager, there's something about the musical director that has to bring that camaraderie together, that has to command the command, but get that kind of respect, but also knows how to manage those personalities. Because if the shit ain't right on the bus and outside, when you get on stage, the music ain't gonna write and the artists will know. Amen. Jeff, what's your cash app? I'm gonna send you an offering right now. You, right you preaching now. now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I've been touring for 26 years. I know that, I know that's why you got that job because I've had great musical directors. Great. There was one specifically that I didn't like that much. I didn't like that much because they didn't like the, we, we got them okay, but they didn't like the fact that I had a really good relationship with the artists. Yeah. And they thought that when I spoke about something that was different from what they wanted, they felt like I was speaking for like I was a like I was a mole or something, like I was a mole. I never crossed those lines, and I know that it, everybody's not built to manage personalities, and that's one of the reasons why you got that job. Not just because you were dope, because you knew how to manage grown folk and sometimes younger guys. You know, sometimes younger guys and seasoned guys. You know, you got to have the right personalities on a band, not just dope players. But we're gonna live together for almost a year or six months. You have to be able to manage those personalities on the road and on stage, you know, massage egos and pride and all those things. And that's why you got that job. That's why those I'm telling you, that's why you got that job. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so um, real quick, I'm sorry, you guys. Um, but from a time perspective, 
I do want to find out from everybody what you all are working on. And um, so I'm going to start with Javon um, really quickly. Javon, what are you working on right now? Uh, pandemic wise, I mean, you know, that shut down a lot of our, I mean, that shut down our industry completely, right? Um, and so for me, uh, the last six months, I've started a production company uh, that was aimed at creating awareness for the social justice issues that have been plaguing our country. Uh, so I've worked with a couple of partners for the last six months, creating content, digital content for Fortune 500 companies. Um, that slowed down a little bit. And so my wife and daughter and I sort of moved, air quotes, to California. Uh, so we've been out in LA uh, for four or five months right now, um, spending time with my best friend. Uh, I took up the stock market, like I told you. And I am just making sure that uh, my business stays ready to go. So we've had uh, enough work since the pandemic, the backline company, basically to cover the bills. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, we're just going to make moves once this thing gets lifted. So I am, uh, I'm, I'm in a good place. My family's healthy and my belly's full. So I'm good. That's awesome. That's awesome. James, what you working on, babe? Um, before I get into that, I just want to say, I almost forgot we was on a podcast because I was just enjoying everything that everybody was saying. I listened to Truth. Jeff. I yeah. felt like when he, when Jeff was talking, I was just visualizing his back and forth. I went here. I was with Jay. I was with, I'm like, I'm excited. Like, dang, this is dope. So I, I, I'm thankful that we had this conversation. It was therapeutic. Very much. Um, um, what I'm working on now, as um, I spoke to you uh, a few days back, April. Um, so, so like Javon said, when the pandemic came, it kind of wiped everything out. Um, but I've been blessed to stay afloat. Um, I've had uh, many of opportunities uh, to get paid virtually. Um, and so I finally identified an opportunity where I can actually be uh, face to face with with those who are uh, are paying to see us. Um, so we're doing a residency in Africa for a couple weeks coming up. So I'm excited for that. So now we're just putting the show together right now. Um, just FYI, uh you're dope. Okay. Um, <laughs> Tracy. Okay. What am I working on? Well, I'm working on me because these past 11 years of touring, I've been working on everybody else. So um, that being said, I know a lot of us have done virtual, like James said, uh, I developed a course called Pop and Piano. Um, I took piano lessons growing up. They were boring. Oh, the joy just bored me. So this uh, course is teaching kids. When you hear Money on the Radio by Cardi B, just that E flat to E, it's a simple half step. But I'm using songs that kids and teenagers are familiar with to bring the fundamentals of piano together and make it interesting for them and working on developing an ebook for it so I can generate an income by being in my beautiful sleep that I can get now after I get that together. Uh, and more music too. I released a single September 29th of last year, but I got to do more because it's in my heart. It's in my spirit to do it. So um, I want to do like Jeff and just get in there and, and do it not just for everybody, but for me first Everybody's not gonna love what you do, uh, but everybody, there will be somebody that will gravitate towards your product and your art. So I'm doing it for those people who are waiting on me. Yes. <laughs> That's it for me. Okay, okay. And um, so I got Jeff. Jeff, I before you even tell me what you're working on, I just wanna put it out there that I am tired of hosting the shows that you perform at. And the next time I am hosting a show that you're performing on, I am going to grab the mic um, and sing, I don't care what you say, because I carry my own mic at all times when I'm hosting shows. So um, I just want to make this known that the next time that we share a stage together, you play something, watch a voice come out of nowhere, and you... Okay? I'm just putting it out there for the world to hear, because I am not playing. Amen? Amen. All right. What are you working on, Jim? That's not the first time you've actually said that to me. Well, so, You're going to come out with your own mic. Well, no, because I, I always have my own mic. I was going to do it the last time when, you, when your foot was broken. Okay? Oh, right, right. But right. I was being polite because it was your show. But right. I want to be known that the next time that I host the show that you are on, mm -hmm. I will grab the mic and I'm going to sing something 
Okay. <laughs> that's the deal. That's 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 the deal. I, I received. I, I I got that. I got that. I well, you don't have that. a choice. <laughs> uh, yeah, clearly, clearly, I don't. Um, uh, first of all, it's it's truly it's truly been an honor to be on here with all of us. You know, all these incredible people and. Um, uh, to meet most of you for the first time. Um, I, um, um, I love gatherings where we all have different superpowers and then we talk about how, you know, I always learn. I'm a sponge. I've always been a sponge. Learn, you know. I've always wanted to learn about the stock market, Javon. So that's a, a side conversation. Let me get your number. And I, I want to, I have questions. Uh, I have questions because I have, Two daughters that are graduating from college this year. Yeah. Two, two, two my two daughters that are graduating from uh, two HBCUs this year. Kayla's graduating from Clark Atlanta. Maya's graduating from uh, Fort Valley State. So I have two daughters graduating from college, and I got two sons. That's twelve and five. That's coming up, and I and hopefully I can put. Uh, thank you, Toronto. I can, I can um, <clears throat> put myself in even more position financially to be able to put them to school, put my two sons to my two sons through school as well um, when they're when they're ready. Uh, uh, but right now I am working on um, uh, promoting my brand, uh, which is uh, my new record company, Bone Deep Enterprises, uh, which um, I've had uh, major distribution with E1 and the Purpose Music Group and putting out my the best album of my career, the album that features uh, Raheem Devon and Robert Glasper and Marsha Ambrosius and Mickey Miller and Amber from Moonchild and Frank McCone and Glenn Lewis and, and Christian McBride, Mike Burton, Paula Champion, Jazzy Jeff, Chubb Rock, uh, Jeff Morrell and Kanye Doss and uh, um, I mean, James Poyser. It's, it's the biggest record of my life. It's called Stronger. If you guys don't have it, anybody listening out there, uh, it is the 2021 album of the year. Uh, it's number one in Italy, number one in the UK, number five in the country right now. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, interesting in this position because I can't get on the road and support it, but it's been such a blessing and such a movement online that I've, I've developed so many new fans just because everybody's home and I've been able to talk and, and release music and videos. And we just released the third single, um, celebrate featuring Kanye Doss off the album. And, um, I am running like I stole something. And I'm pushing and running this brand and pushing my brand and, and looking forward to signing new and upcoming artists because now this being my fourth album, uh, third record company, which is now my own, um, I know the side of the business that I didn't know before. And now I'm very excited. I have a great team, a great radio promoter, a great manager, a great attorney, and um, great PR people. And um, I'm just trying to do something that hasn't been done. I'm trying to have the number one album in the country um, I'm trying to have the album of the year to be a trombone player, be the first trombone player to have an album of the year. And I think um, I made my case with this record and I'm going to continue to try to make my case and push harder and hard as I can to push stronger to be the album of the year. Um, uh, continuing to raise my babies and um, raise my sons uh, like the, the Christian God-fearing man, pastor, a uh, youth pastor like my father, the late Norman Bradshaw was and I continue to try to be a good person and encourage people to be safe out here during this time. Uh, I'm truly blessed blessed to be here with you guys tonight. And uh, hopefully we can forge relationships beyond this um, and we can continue to learn from each other just to be better people, better how to have better financial literacy and be able to take care of our families and our parents. You know, So I'm blessed to be here. And uh, Noel, thank you so much for giving us a space where we can come together and be sponges and learn from one another and help answer questions for people who may not have known the answers that we gave and that we have these relationships now that we will forge and move on and be better people uh, in this world. To God be the glory. Amen. Well, listen, I want to say thank you to all of you for being a part of this amazing panel and to everybody who's watching out there, make sure that you are following all these amazing people. They have so much information. So just following them on social media, you're always able to learn just by what they post. So please make sure that you're following. And also, Noel, I'm sure you're going to tell them about what you're doing on Clubhouse. So again, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being a part of this amazing team. And uh, what's up, Brody? 
How you doing? You doing? <laughs> well, back to you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, April. Uh, everyone, I want to thank you guys again for your time and your insight, your invaluable insight, uh, as well to all of you that are watching. Um, I want everybody to, I'm sorry, this was really a great conversation. Um, it really, really was. Like I, I appreciate all of you guys for answering the call and saying when. Um, that really means a lot to not only myself, but to What's Up Brody and what we're doing and how we will grow. Um, so I had to put that in there again, but back to the script. Um, <laughs> next week, we will be continuing the conversation in breaking down equity. Uh, next week, we will go to television and theater for creatives and producers. So be sure to follow the What's Up Brody Facebook and Instagram pages for up-to-date information on upcoming discussions. And for the Clubhouse members, like April was saying, uh, you can join us tomorrow and every Wednesday night at 8 on Clubhouse for the What's Up Brody recap room. You can follow me on the platform for more information. Uh, my handle is at N-O-E. S-O-R-A-Y-A. -A. That is no Soraya. And thank you guys. Peace, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Love you, Noel. Thank you so thank much. You. I love y'all too, man. Peace, y'all.